She called. It was their first Christmas in Galway together, mother and son. The cottage was hidden alongside the Atlantic, blue windowed, slate roofed, tucked near a grove of sycamore trees. The branches were bent inland by the wind. White spindrift blew up from the sea, landing softly on the tall hedges in the back garden. During the day, Rebecca could hear the rhythmic approach and fall of the waves against the shore. At night, the sounds seemed to double. Even in the wet chill of the December evenings, she slept with her window open, listening to the roll of the water sounding up from the low cliffs, rasping over the run of stone walls, sweeping toward the house, where it seemed to pause, hover a moment, then break. On Christmas morning, she left his present by the fireplace, boxed and wrapped and tied with red ribbons. Thomas tore the package open and it fell in a bundle at his feet. He had no idea what it was at first. He held it by the legs, then the waist, turned it upside down, clutched it dark against his chest. She reached behind the tree and removed a second package, neoprene boots and a hood. Thomas stripped his shoes and his shirt. He was thin, strong, pale. When he pulled off his trousers, she glanced away. The wetsuit was liquid around him. She had bought it two sizes too big so he could grow into it. He spread his arms wide and whirled around the room. She hadn't seen him so happy in months. Rebecca gestured to him that they would go down to the water in a few hours. Thirteen years old, and there was already a whole history written in him. She had adopted him from Vladivostok at the age of six. On her visit to the orphanage, she had seen him crouched beneath the swing set. His hair was blonde, his eyes a pellucid blue, sores on his neck, long thin scars on his lower back. His gums were soft and bloody. He'd been born deaf, but when she called out his name, he had turned quickly toward her, a sign she was sure of. Him. Shards of his story would always be a mystery to her. The early years, an ancestry she knew nothing about, a rumour that he'd been born near a rubbish dump. Possible inheritances, mercury, radiation sickness, beatings. She was aware of what she was getting herself into, but she had been with Alan then. They stayed in a shabby hotel overlooking the Bay of Amour. Days of bribes and panic, anxious phone calls late in the night, long hours in the waiting room. A diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome gave them pause. Still, they left after six weeks, swinging Thomas between them. On the Aeroflot flight, the boy kept his head on her shoulder. At customs in Dublin, her fingers trembled over the paperwork. The stamp came down when Alan signed. She grabbed Thomas's hand and ran him laughing through arrivals. It was her 41st birthday. The days were good then, a three-bedroom house in step aside, a series of counsellors, therapists, speech experts, and even her parents to help them out. Now, seven years on, she was divorced, living out west. Her parents were gone and her task had doubled. Her savings were stretched. The bills slipped one after the other through the letterbox. There were rumours that the special school in Galway might close. Still, she wasn't given to bitterness or loud complaint. She made a living translating from Hebrew to English. Wedding vows, business contracts, cultural pamphlets. There was a literary novel or two from a left-wing publisher in Tel Aviv. The pay was derisory, but she liked stepping into that otherness. The books were a stay against indifference. 48 years old, and there was a beauty about her, an olive to her skin, a slow to her eyes, an aquiline sweep to her nose. Her hair was dark, her body thin and supple. In a small village she fit in well, even if she stood at a sharp angle to the striking blondness of her son. She relished the gale tucked, the shifting weather, the hard light, the wind off the Atlantic. Bundled up against the chill, they walked along the pier, amongst the lobster pots and coiled ropes and disintegrating fishing boats. The rain slapped the windows of the shuttered shops. No tourists in winter. In the supermarket, the local women often watched them, more than once Rebecca was asked if she was the band Cowrock. A phrase she liked. The help, the nanny, the midwife. There was a raw wedge of thrill in her love for him. The presence of the unknown. The journey out of childhood. The step into a future self. Some days Thomas took her hand, leaned on her shoulder as they drove to the village, beyond the abandoned schoolhouse, past the whitewashed bungalows toward home. She wanted to clasp herself over him, shroud him, absorb whatever came his way. Most of all, she wanted to discover what man might emerge from underneath that very pale skin.
Thomas wore the wetsuit all Christmas morning. He lay on the floor, playing video games, his fingers fluid on the console. Over the rim of her reading glasses, Rebecca watched the grey stripe along the sleeve move. It was, she knew, a game she shouldn't allow. Tanks, ditches, killings, tracer bullets. But it was a small sacrifice for an hour of quiet. No rage this Christmas, no battles, no tears. At noon, she gestured for him to get ready. The light would fade early. She had two wetsuits of her own in the bedroom cupboard, but she left them hanging, pulled on running shoes and anorak a warm scarf. At the door, Thomas threw his duffel coat loose around the neoprene. Just a quick dip, she said to him in Irish. There was no way of knowing how much of any language Thomas could understand. His signing was rudimentary, but she could tell a thing or two from the carry of his body, the shape of his shoulders, the hold of his mouth. Mostly she divined from his eyes. He was handsome in a roguish way. The eyes themselves were narrow, yes, but agile. He had no other physical symptoms of fetal alcohol, no high brow, no thin lip, no flat, flat philtrum. They stepped out into a shaft of light so clear and bright it seemed made of bone. Just by the low stone wall, a cloud curtained across and the light dropped grey again. A few stray raindrops stung their faces. This was what she loved about the west of Ireland. The weather made from cinema. A squall could blow in at any time, and moments later the grey would be hunted open with blue. One of the walls down by the bottom field had been reinforced with metal pipes. It was the worst sort of masonry against all local tradition. But the wind moved across the mouth of the hollow tubes and pierced the air with a series of accidental whistles. Thomas ran his hand over the pipes one by one, adjusting the song of the wall. She was sure his fingers could gauge the vibrations in the metal. Small moments like these, they crept up, sliced her open. Halfway toward the water, he broke into a Charlie Chaplin walk, twirling an imaginary walking stick as he bent forward into the gale, feet pointed sideways. He made a whooping sound as he topped a rise and caught sight to the sea. She called for him to wait. It was habit, even if his back was turned. He remained at the edge of the cliff, walking in place, almost a perfect imitation. Where had he seen Chaplin? Some video game, maybe? Some television show? There were times she thought that, despite the doctors, he might still someday crack open the impossible longings she held for him. At the precipice, above the grey sea stack, they paused. The waves hurried to shore, long scribbles of white. She tapped him on the small of his back where the wetsuit bunched. The neoprene hood framed his face, his blonde hair peeked out. Stay where it's shallow now, she said. Promise me. She scooted behind him on her hunkers. The grass was cold on her fingertips. Her feet slid forward in the mud, dropped from the small ledge into the coarse scree below. The rocks were slick with seaweed. A small crab scuttled in a dark pool. Thomas was already knee-deep in the cove. Don't go any further now, she called. She had been a swimmer when she was a child, had competed for Dublin and Leinster both, rows of medals in her childhood bedroom, a championship trophy from Brussels, the rumour of a scholarship to an American university, a rotator cuff injury had cut her short. She had taught Thomas to swim during the warmth of the summer. He knew the rules, no diving, stay in the cold, never get close to the base of the sea stack. Twice he looked as if he were about to round the edge of the dark rock into the deeper water, once when he saw a windsurfer. Yet again, when a yellow kayak went swiftly by, she waved her arms, just no more, love, okay? He returned to her, fanned the low water with his fingers, splashed it high, both arms in his chaplain motion. Stop it, please, said Rebecca softly. You're soaking me. He splashed her again, turned away, dove under for 10 seconds, 14 seconds, 15, 18, came up 10 yards away, spluttering for air. Come on now, please, come in. Thomas swam toward the sea stack the dark of his feet disappearing into the water. She watched the wetsuit ripple under the surface, a long, sleek shadow. A flock of seabirds serried over the waves in a low taunt. Her body stiffened. She edged forward again. She waited. I have, she thought, made a terrible mistake.